Good afternoon, everyone. Can't believe we're back here again already. It seems like just yesterday. Glad to be back here with you. Greetings to everyone. And uh, it's 10 weeks to the feast. I hope you're ready. It's going to be here before we know it. And uh, hope you're making plans for the feast. And uh, I was just looking through the calendar this morning and saw how close it is and realized I still have a lot to do to get ready for the feast. So I hope you are too. And uh, looks like we've got all of the the feast brochure is done. And uh, some of the feast schedules, I'm sure, are going to be printed in the coming weeks. So we'll finalize all of those. And I hope that uh, we uh, have a good feast this year everywhere. Have you ever heard a parent say, if you do that one more time, I'm going to have to punish you? Now, we hear kids in the grocery, parents in the grocery store say this to their kids, and we kind of wish they would go ahead and punish their kids. Or this is your last warning. You know, you ever heard a parent say that? If you do that one more time, and the parents, but eventually, I guess, some of the parents truly, even though they hate to do this, But out of love and concern and long-term behavior of their children, the parent has no other option but to sometimes discipline their children. And that comes in the case of just standing in the corner or sitting over in timeout or or maybe even a a small pat on on the backside. God is very similar in dealing with mankind. He allows us very great leadway and gives us every opportunity to walk in obedience to Him and in the paths of righteousness, as we call it. He gives us plenty of instructions. He lays down His laws that tells us, even Leviticus, the 8th chapter says, which if a man do, he shall live in them. He gives us examples that are replete throughout the Bible, the parables. He also corrects, He chastens, And he suffers long with us just like a parent does their child. And he even forgives us from time to time, doesn't he, when we do wrong and we ask him to. This is his response to those who diligently seek him and those that are desiring to obey his commandments. But there's an altogether different response to those who continually live in a state of rebellion against his will. I'd like to look at an example of that in 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, where a man named Saul, who was actually chosen, you know, by God, or by the people, I should say, to, to be the king over Israel. God gave him some instructions. He gave him a command. In the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, he says, and the... God told him to go in under the Amalekites and destroy them. Look in verse 3. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So here God tells him to go in there and completely annihilate the whole village or city or people. I guess they had become so absolutely corrupt and heinous in God's eyes that there wasn't worth saving not a single one of them. And so Saul gathered 200,000 of his men and 10,000 men of Judah, and he went and laid siege to the city. And he took Agag, look down in verse 8, the king of the Amalekites alive, but he, and he utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and uh, refuse that they had uh, destroyed utterly. And then the word of the Lord came unto Samuel. And he says to Samuel, It repents me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. You know why? Because Samuel knew that it was going to be his duty to go and tell the king the Lord's word. That's a difficult 
thing to do as a man, especially going before a king such as Saul. And Samuel rose up early in, in, to meet Saul in the morning, and he came to Carmel. And he said, down at verse 13, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And you know the answer to that. Did he really, did he completely perform the commandment of the Lord? And uh, Samuel said, What meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And, he, and Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep in the auction and sacrificed unto the Lord, so that we could sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we've utterly destroyed. We're, we're really doing this for God's sake. And Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell you what the Lord has said unto me this night. When you were, when you were little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel, and the Lord sent thee on a journey and the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. And now to verse twenty one it says, But the people took the spoil of the sheep and oxen the chief things that had been which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord in Gilgal. And Samuel said Look at verse 22, and this gets to the point of the matter here. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion, now listen to this, is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, and he has also rejected you from being king. I try to, you know, imagine what Saul was thinking at this point. Of course, he immediately began to crawfish. You know, but the thought came to my mind that, you know, Saul, he did about 90% of what God told him to do, didn't he? Or maybe 80%. I don't know. You can extrapolate that out he almost did everything that God commanded him to do he almost kept all of what God had told him and, and instructed him to do it's like what Paul wrote in the New Testament about missing the mark you know he was on his way to fulfilling what God had commanded him and yet he deviated from it and what did it cost him I mean God completely rejected him and removed him eventually from being king. Look over at 1 Chronicles, the 10th chapter. We'll see the end of that. 1 Chronicles 10. Both of these are parallel stories here. The 1 Samuel goes into a little more detail. But 1 Chronicles, the 10th chapter, down in verse 13. So Samuel died for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord's, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. And of course, you remember the story how he, when Samuel died, he went and, you know, tried to visit with this witch and, and conjure up the spirit of Samuel. And of course, God absolutely rejected all of that and, and removed him. And, and as a result of that, he was killed here in, in battle. In Isaiah, the first chapter here, I won't read... Uh, all of this, but I wanted to just get a little bit of this. In Isaiah, the first chapter, here's a great warning against Judah, the, which God called a sinful nation. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nursed and brought up children, and they've rebelled against me, as I said in the beginning, like a parent with a child. God has raised up children, and they've completely rejected him. And he's calling Israel, and more importantly, Judah, uh, he, he speaks of them as if they're just completely rebellious children that won't even hear anything that he says. He's, you know, he goes on to say that the ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not consider a sinful nation of people laden with iniquity and a seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. I want to skip ahead here down to verse 10. 
He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of God, you people of Gomorrah. I wrote in my notes here, can you imagine standing up in front of, say, Congress and the Senate or maybe at a State of the Union address and saying these words? Hear you people of Sodom, you rulers of Gomorrah. Because that's what this message was intended. It was intended to go to the leadership of these people who had corrupted the whole nation. This message truly needs to go to our nation today. It really does. It really does with what is all reported in our news and what the corruption that We'll never know all the truth. Of course, someday we will on, upon God's return. We will know the answer to all of these great dark places and secrets of you know, contracts of things that, that have been made within our government and that have affected the people of our country greatly. He says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says the Lord? I'm full of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks and the lamb of he goats. I, it's interesting here that he immediately directs his attention to the religious people. He is speaking here to a nation that has religion. Otherwise, this wouldn't be wouldn't wouldn't be uh, he wouldn't it'd be a, a wrong for him to even address this issue. But these were the religious people. He says, when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain ob oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. He's talking about religious people that are coming in before him. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And you, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you as if they're there in prayer before God. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. But look at the result. Look what God is appealing to them for. Wash you Make you clean and put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. How you do that? Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. He's telling them. He's giving them a choice here. But if you refuse, like Saul did, and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. We find here that this is a warning to this nation that if they continue to be rebellious that the result was going to be war in their land and they would be completely destroyed by this war why doesn't our nation seek god why won't our nation beseech god for his instruction and his direction we know that he is able to provide us with protection and with strength and with safety as he did on many occasions with these nations we read, or especially the nation of Israel that we read about in God's word. He's also able to hear our prayers and he can listen to our concerns. In Isaiah the 59th chapter, we'll go over here and read a, another little portion here where he mentions there or he he addresses their national corruption and the consequences of their suffering. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. It's not God's fault. It's their fault, the people's fault, because they've turned their back. He says, your, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. He cannot look upon 
this disgusting, uh, abhorrent situation because man has absolutely become heinous and his hands are filled with blood. Look what he says. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. I read this morning. I had to go back and look because I've been watching this for the last couple of years. The city of Baltimore. It's we don't hear much about it in the news. Now, you got to go look it up. But on May the 9th, now this, this report was the earliest or the latest one I could find. They've already surpassed the murder rate that they had last year. Of over 100 murders that have taken place this year in the city of Baltimore. Now, I've traveled. I've been to Baltimore. I walked around that city and I had no idea how dangerous it was to be in that city. I went down to the dock there and went on the, the U.S. Constitution and saw that great ship and walked up and down the streets there just doing some sightseeing and on a meeting that I was up there one year. And I didn't realize how bloody that city is. And that's only one of a number of cities in our nation that are similar in like Chicago and other places that are so violent that it's a danger to get out of your car. He says... None calls for justice, none, nor any pleads for truth. They trust in vanity. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch viper's eggs. And he goes on to talk about it like breaking out these eggs that they would use or would break out into a viper because it's a comparison between their, their, uh, their lies and their evil that they commit instead of being righteous. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are the works of iniquity. Their feet run to do evil, down in verse 7. The way of peace they know not, down in verse 8. Therefore, judgment is far from us, down in verse 9. Uh, he says, uh, Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but we, uphold, we behold obscurity for brightness. But we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are, we are in desolate places as dead men. We roar, we roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. Of course, he goes on down in the latter part of that chapter there where he talks about truth that has failed, that has completely fallen in the streets. And uh, I believe that that truly uh, describes the situation in our country today. And I believe it is a warning that God has given us to, uh, to warn the nation with and to you know, blow the trumpet as he he instructed us to do. In Jeremiah the seventh chapter, he gives us the terms of a of a of a nation that would live in a condition of peace. Look what he says in Jeremiah the seventh chapter, down in verse one. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there his, this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you Judah, that enter into these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in peace. God here is beseeching this city and this nation. If they will amend their ways, then they will dwell in this place and dwell there peaceably. Trust you not in lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And again, he's talking here to religious people. The reason that he mentions this here is because these people were there and they had the temple, the real temple in Jerusalem. And he, they were saying, we have the temple. We can never fall. And God's saying, quit using that as a... Uh, a reason. It's like the ark. You remember the ark when they they were losing in battle and the ancient Israelites decided to go get the ark and carry it into battle with them. And you remember on that occasion where 
it, uh, the ark was taken captive by the Philistines. They thought just by carrying that ark on their shoulders out there in front of them in battle that God was going to be with them. The same thing is here. They're, they believe because they have this temple in their land, in their city, that no one could invade. And they're only using these outward devices as symbols of God, and yet within their heart, they had no they had no repentance. They had no devotion to God whatsoever. For you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor. And again, he mentions the stranger and the fatherless and the widow. Then I will cause you to dwell in this place and land that I gave your fathers forever and ever. There's the choice. There's the option. But that wasn't to be the case. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and burn incense under Baal, and walk after other gods who you know not? Remember, God said, learn not the way of the heathen. And come and stand before me in this house. After all of that, you're going to come and stand before God in his house, which is called by my name. Will you, we are, and say we're delivered to do all of these abominations. And is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Jesus even said that, you know, when he cleansed the temple, you know, even in his day. He said it was to be a house of prayer, not a, a den of thieves. That, that, had, that is exactly what they had become there. He said, Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go you now unto my place, which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did for the wickedness of the people of Israel. And as I mentioned, Shiloh was the place where, where was, was the first place, actually, that the ark was stored. And that was where they went and grabbed the ark and carried it out before the Philistines. And, of course, they were put to... They were, uh, they were defeated by the Philistines and Ark was taken captive. Uh, he goes on to talk about their, uh, how he took the nation uh, of Ephraim, the, the northern tribes of Israel, away captive when he mentions down in verse 15 uh, the whole seed of Ephraim, how he had carried them out of his sight because they had rejected his word. And then he talks about how they observe the queen of heaven down in verse 18. He said, do you provoke me to anger? Do they not provoke themselves to confusion of their own faces? It's not hurting me, it's only hurting them. In verse 22, for I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, obey my voice. And I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk you in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. And they would not have it. The people of Israel and the people of Judah absolutely rejected God's laws and God's word. I don't know how many years it's been. Now, it's been over 80 years, I guess, now, that the church of God that I've been associated with from before I was born, have preached against all of these abominable practices, such as mentioned here, the Queen of Heaven, which some have speculated to be Ashtaroth or Asheroth or Ishtar or Easter in our country. We've preached against the abominable practice of Christmas, which is dear, near and dear to the hearts of many, many people in our country. They don't even want to discuss the issue. They don't even want to contemplate that it might be a pagan practice that God absolutely abhors. Easter and Christmas and, of course, Halloween, which that one is, I believe, fairly easy for most Christians because what does God have to do with ghouls and goblins and evil spirits and demonism, which he absolutely condemns in the Word of God? That we're not to seek out these evil spirits. We read that in Paul's life. I mean, Saul's life, I should say. We've tried to teach the truth about the Sabbath day. We, I did a sermon last week very extensively on the Sabbath day and done hundreds of them in my lifetime. We've tried to talk about the holy days and how they reveal the plan of God. We've tried to 
to enlighten people on the truth of the Godhead, that he's not a trinity, that he is actually God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son. We've tried to preach and teach uh, strictly from the Bible what the Word of God actually says, which most people are completely ignorant. But about the resurrection, for instance, that we don't go to heaven when we die, but that God in His Word actually speaks of a resurrection. We've tried to teach people that God's kingdom is coming here to this earth, that the establishment of the kingdom of God is going to be here on this earth. And we get this information straight from God's Word. And people will not listen. They will reject it. And it is absolutely the truth of God. It is preached from the pages of the Bible. It is not some man's imagination. It has been taken from the, from the Word of God. And our nation is a rebellious nation still. As it was in the days of Isaiah and in the days of Jeremiah. They are still stiff-necked and hard-hearted and will not listen to the truth of God. And it's been preached uh, very interestingly, I think, in times past. It's been, it's been promoted as uh, a, a, way of, a different way of looking at religion as a whole. We've tried to preach the truth about who Jesus Christ is really is, and not this deluded idea of some baby away in the manger, but who Jesus Christ really was as a person here on this earth, and the life he lived, and how he conducted his life, and how he set an example for us to live. And people want to wash it all away, so that they can observe their own little idea of who Jesus is. And God, I believe, has been very, very patient for many centuries. But I believe there is coming a time when God's patience is going to run out with people who belligerently and rebelliously will not give in to their own idea of religion. In, uh, I want to go back here to Ezekiel, the seventh chapter. Skip ahead here a little bit. Ezekiel, the seventh chapter. Here's a clear warning, I guess, of the impending wrath of God that's going to be poured out on people because of their abominable practice. Look at Ezekiel, the seventh chapter. I could go back and read all of Ezekiel's message, his calling, why he was called, the warning message that was to go out. You know that Ezekiel, the message of Ezekiel is still to be preached. And what do I mean by that? Well, Ezekiel's message was to be preached to Israel, right? Everyone knows that. He was called to go preach to the nation of Israel. The problem is, when Ezekiel was giving this message or writing down this message, he was in captivity. The nation of Israel had already gone into captivity 124, or 3 or 4 years before that. So the message of Ezekiel is still to be preached to the nation of Israel. A lot of people reject who Israel is today. They think it's that little bitty nation over there in, in the Middle East today. Instead of really looking into the Word of God and understanding who Israel and Judah truly are and that these words are meant for our nation today, the United States of America and Britain and Australia and Canada and many other nations around the world. He says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Also thou son of man, thus says the Lord God in the land of Israel, An end, the end is come upon the four corners of the land. Now is the end come upon you, and I will send my anger upon you, and I will judge you according to your ways, and will recompense upon thee all your abominations. You want to know what is abominable to God? Go back here to Proverbs, the sixth chapter. I'll flip here and read this for you. For you, These things doth the Lord hate. Seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. Now, how many people you know have got a proud look on their face? You can watch some of this television, some of these interviews, like Mark was mentioning. The arrogance, oh, the arrogance is so unbelievable at times that you can almost, you just can't stomach it. How about a lying tongue? 
I know some people that can't go a day without telling a big lie. Hands that shed innocent blood. And that means that goes all the way back to the source of any activity, of any project, of any job, any contract that would cause the loss of human life so you can greedily stuff your pockets with profits. How about a heart that devises wicked imaginations? Is there any of that in the pornography industry, in the drug industry, in alcohol and cigarettes, tobacco industry? Do they prey upon innocent people? The wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift and running to mischief. How about a false witness that speaks lies? <laughs> Mark gave a whole list of those here in the opening statements that he made. Of people that will just lie because they, ha they have no conscience whatsoever about lying. We're going to read a scripture here in a moment about what God thinks about liars. He says... A false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among brethren. Now that is directed, I believe, at people in God's church. Anyone that would sow discord among the brethren, that would stir up something between church members. I believe that is a very, very stern warning there for those that would do something of that nature. Jesus said in the New Testament in Mark, you don't have to turn there, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is in hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. Now I'm going to soften it up just a bit here. I know the opening here has been quite harsh. God, Jesus Christ came to this earth to preach repentance. And he, he instructed people to repent. But he also preached about a coming kingdom of God that's going to be here on this earth, as I said. And it's supposed to be good news. Jesus' message was about the beautiful establishment of his kingdom, his rulership, his reign over this earth to put down evil, wickedness, and wicked people that exist on this earth. And also... Spiritual wickedness, as Paul called it, in high places. He, he came to give us that good news. We can wallow if we want to indefinitely in all of this bad news. And there is a warning that has to go out. And as I've said before, I hate to give that because it's not my favorite subject. But it is a responsibility that God gave us to, to give a witness and a warning to this evil, rotten nation in which we live in, and world for that matter. But we're also to balance that with the good news that someday God is going to live here on this earth. And all of this iniquity and evilness is going to be washed away. He says you're no longer going to see these evil, wicked people, sinners are going to be, as it tells us in Malachi, ashes under the feet of the righteous. You're not even going to remember them anymore. So we have to concentrate some of our efforts on the good news too, right? And know that someday God is going to reign here on this earth. And it's going to be beautiful. Look at Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 we read at the Feast of Tabernacles. The, the change that's going to take place on this earth. And you're not even going to believe it. You're going to think that you live in, a, in an imaginary place because it's going to be so wonderful and delightful and beautiful and peaceful. I think we need to dwell on those things as well. In Isaiah, the second chapter, it says, The law shall go forth out of Zion. God's law out of his temple to be spread all over the earth. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, go over here. Jesus also gives a stern warning to religious people. Look what he says. Matthew 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So that tells me that not just the outward verbal acknowledgement, all you got to say is, I believe, as they say. 
not, that's not good enough for Jesus Christ. He says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And there's plenty of that going on out there, I can guarantee you. And in thy name have we not cast out demons or devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, built buildings and missionaries and schools and hospitals. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity or lawlessness. And yet the whole world is out here saying that old law is done away. I believe that God, I believe that Satan's deceived the whole world as, as the Bible tells us. And that most people reject the truth of God for their own form of religion. In Luke the third chapter, I want to look at this example here because here was the man that was, Jesus said, there was no greater than John the Baptist. And he's standing there on the River Jordan and all of these religious elites are coming down to him. And he says down in verse 7, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath of come? Now you talk about insult. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham out to our fathers. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. In Luke 3 and verse 9, And now also the axe is laid in the root of the tree. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people ask him, What will we do then? And he said, he that has two coats, let him impart one uh, to him that has none. And he that has meat, do likewise. Share what you have. Then also came the publicans to be baptized and said, Master, what will we do? And he said, Exact no more than that which is appointed to you. And of course the tax collectors were under the Roman uh, government. They were actually employed by the Roman government and told, You've got to go out and collect this much tax. And you bring it to us, and whatever else you collect, you can keep. So tax collectors were good at extorting money out of people so they could line their own pockets. And Jesus is telling them, you know, that's not right. That's not fair. You do, you exact only what is, in, what is needed, what is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, and what will we do? And he said, do violence to no man. Neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, all people mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. John indeed answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I comes, the latches of, who, of who, whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. A lot of people have taken that to believe that that means they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But look at the next verse. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and he will gather the wheat into his garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. He's talking about destroying evil, wicked human beings that will not repent. In Romans, the second chapter, Paul describes the comparison between those that obey the truth of God and those who don't. I'd like to turn there, if you would, jump up. Romans 2. Romans 2 and verse 1, he said, Therefore thou art excusable, O man, whosoever you judge, for wherein, wherein do you judge another? You condemn yourself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of a God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and does, and does the same thing? For thou shall, do you think that you will escape the judgment of God is the question that he's asking here. Or despisest thou the riches and goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance? But after your hardness and impotent heart, 
treasureth up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Let's see down in verse, I wanted to skip ahead here. Oh, that was the compare. He's making the comparison here. Who will render every man according to his deeds. To them that by, well, by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. That's the, on the one hand. But on the other hand, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. In Philippians 2, I want to go here. There's another example here I wanted to read where Paul tells the Philippians, uh, or he encourages, I should say, the Philippians to remain obedient. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Wherefore, uh, Philippians 2 and verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved... As you, are, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of of a crooked and perverse nation uh, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And of course, remember what Jesus said, that we're to be the salt of the earth and we're to be the light that is up on the hill, even though we live in a, the midst of a perverse generation. In 2 Thessalonians, maybe I'll just read one more example here. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, where Paul writes of the judgment of God upon, the, upon those uh, that, that reject him. He said, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. He's talking to the Christians now, those that are trying to walk the straight path and they're, being, they're, they're having tribulation and trouble because of it. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. There is coming a time when Jesus Christ is going to return with all of the angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So here we see Paul encouraging these people to hold the course, to stay the course, because there's coming a time when Christ is going to destroy the wicked out of their sight, out of their way, out of their eyes. In 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, we'll close here with these last few scriptures here. 1 Peter 4. It's an interesting scripture, one scripture here. 1 Peter 4 and verse 17. Peter is instructing the church to be good stewards of the grace of God that he has given each of us. Look what he says in verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now that is a that's a sobering statement, isn't it? That judgment is going to begin at the very house of God, isn't it? And then it's going to go out from there. And how strict will the judgment be against those that are in the house of God in the comparison that he's making about those that are out there that are completely rebellious to God's laws and God's ways that aren't even trying to observe his commandments and be obedient and followers of him. In Jude, the fifth, uh, Jude, a fifth chapter, let's, I want you to find that for me real quick. Jude, verse 5. We'll read here uh, the examples of God's wrath. It says down in verse 6, uh, excuse me, verse 5, 
I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, know how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains and the darkness into the judgment of the great day. Of course, speaking here of the angels that followed Satan in his rebellion, that they're reserved. There's a time of, of judgment reserved for them. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. What happened to those nations? You know, they were completely and utterly destroyed, like Pompeii was, buried in ashes, like a volcanic eruption. And everyone in that city died, both of these cities. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the, split, the, the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending for the de with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And a lot of people, I've always taken that to believe. I've heard people say, I'm going to command the devil to get away from here. I'm going to command the devil to do this or the devil to do that. Here it tells us that even Michael, who is called the prince of the people of Israel. Remember it tells us in the book of Daniel that at that time, Michael, our prince, is going to stand up for the children of thy people. He's powerful enough to protect the nation of Israel. But it tells us he didn't bring an accusation against Satan. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't have the power in and of his own strength to rebuke Satan. That tells me that Satan is tremendously powerful. And he has a grip on the minds and hearts of most of this world. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beast and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, they've gone after the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These were all rebels. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees, whose fruit withers, like we read what Jesus said about the trees that are plucked up and thrown into the fire, with, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, the, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. And their mouth speak great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. I want to close with Re Revelation, the 22nd chapter here. It says here, in the very end of the book John wrote, recorded, the revelation of Jesus Christ, as it tells us. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gate into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. It tells us here that all, in, in another portion in the book of Revelation, that all liars are going to have their place in Gehenna fire, that they're, they're no liar is going to be in God's kingdom. And I think that that, that is extremely important. God's judgment is going to eventually fall upon mankind. We have a choice now whether we want to diligently seek his face, to obey his voice, to search out his ways, and repent and be, humble ourselves before him. With it, will come the greatest reward of eternal life is, is promised by the Word of God. And of course, being in the family of God, which I can't describe how great that will be. Or we can choose the path of continual rebellion, 
living our own lives, going our own way, rejecting His righteous ways, and ultimately suffering the consequences of those actions. But it won't happen without us being warned from God's Word. Let us therefore heed these great warnings and surrender under the mighty hand of God for His love and His protection in, time, in a time just ahead that will sever, sever the evil from all of this world. <laughs>